Thank you very much, Alison, for your um, kind introduction. And I welcome everybody who is attending tonight's uh, webinar with the topic Diagnosis and Management Options of Canine Crouchet Ligament Disease. I hope overall your day was not too exhausting, and um, I hope as well you are still perceptive um, for another hour. Also, we will cover uh, quite a few um, topics. Um, so you will overall be given a brief overview of, uh, the, uh, of important anatomical structures of the stifle joint. Um, I try to um, discuss uh, only very briefly pathophysiology and diagnosis of cranial cruciate ligament um, and uh, the majority, the overall majority of uh, tonight's uh, webinar will be focusing on different treatment options um, of a diseased um, cranial cruciate ligament. Which anatomical um, features should you be aware of? Um, the cranial cruciate ligament runs from the chordomedial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. Uh, which you can see um, here on that picture, um, to the lateral, uh, so to the cranial intercondyloid um, area, um, which you can see here of the tibia. And the cranial cruciate ligament is uh, grossly divided into a larger caudolateral and a smaller cranial medial part. In regards to its functions, the cranial cruciate ligament prevents cranial subluxation of the tibia and it limits internal rotation um, as well as hyperextension of the stifle joint. And therefore, all forces that cause cranial tibial subluxation or excessive internal rotation as well as hyperextension, they uh, put excessive stress on the cranial cruciate ligament, which then uh, would predispose um, the cranial cruciate ligament um, to rupture. Other intraarticular structures of the stifle joint um, which um, are very important are the menisci. They are C-shaped discs of fibrocartilage uh, which are located between the femoral and tibial condyles and they attach firmly with their cranial horns and caudal horns to the tibia which uh, I hope um, you can see the arrow here. So we have here the, t the meniscus which is the medial meniscus and that's the lateral meniscus. And here you can see the attachments um, to um, the tibia. Whereas the lateral meniscus is loosely connected uh, with uh, the femur via the meniscofemoral ligament, which you can see here, the medial meniscus, meniscus is firmly attached with the medial collateral ligament. And this actually predisposes uh, the medial meniscus to be much more often um, injured uh, compared to the lateral meniscus. Because if there's any force acting on the stifle joint, um, the lateral meniscus can um, try to move away uh, and avoids uh, compressive forces, whereas uh, there is no way for the medial meniscus uh, to move uh, either more cranially or caudally, uh, and then um, causing um, or being um, severely injured. The functions of the menisci are um, uh, they provide uh, load bearing, um, they are important part of load distribution, they help to absorb um, shock um, acting on the stifle joint and they are as well, um, uh, so, um, uh, in addition to the cranial cruciate ligament, um, important for uh, providing uh, stability of the joint. That's why any meniscal injury uh, can be of um, significant clinical uh, so of, of important clinical significance. Cranial cruciate ligament disease is over the most common cause of lameness in the canine hind limb. The term cranial cruciate ligament disease uh, covers um, a variety of disorders, including the traumatic avulsion of the cranial cruciate ligament, the acute traumatic rupture, and the progressive degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament. And the last uh, 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 disease is um, the most common disease which uh, we will um, um, discuss uh, mostly during this webinar. But because the etiology, the pathogenesis, and the treat treatment of all the three um, diseases mentioned here, um, they need to be um, considered um, separately. Uh, let's start with uh, avulsion of the cranial cruciate ligament. This type of injury usually occurs in immature animals where an acute overload of the ligament may result in avulsion of the ligament rather than a mid-substance tear. And overall, the tibial attachment side is much more commonly affected. So the tibial um, uh, attachment side would be here. It's much more commonly affected than uh, the femoral attachment side. And when you do your clinical examination, 
usually uh, you feel joint diffusion and a positive cranial drawer uh, test. Uh, but um, there should not be any kind of osteophyte or anthesophyte as this is an acute injury um, in, which is different uh, to the chronic progression of the cranial cruciate ligament. In comparison to the progressive degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament, uh, primary repair um, can be um, um, uh, successful in evulsion, but it's not um, successful in the chronic uh, degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament. The evulsed fragment, uh, which uh, you, you can see here, a type of technique, the avulsed fragment can be reattached with orthopedic wires or uh, with K wires and bone screw. It depends if it's a small fragment uh, or if it's a large fragment. And overall, it's a very rare disease uh, and this uh, it also applies for um, the next um, disease I want to uh, briefly mention, uh, acute triatic rupture of the cranial cruciate ligament. If, this, if the cranial cruciate ligament is acutely overloaded, um, then an acute and uh, very often complete mid-substance tear uh, can be the consequence. And owners very often report an acute onset of non-weight-bearing lameness after um, the dog was playing with a ball um, or frisbee. The lameness usually improves over three to five days and uh, what we uh, very often do in these cases, we uh, recommend uh, a few days of uh, lead box only, uh, possibly uh, pro prescribing uh, anti-inflammatories um, and uh, this lameness improves, um, however the patient um, remains um, still significantly lame and when uh, these patients then present um, at uh, the practice, uh, you can identify severe pain, joint diffusion, and again, um, an instable joint, but no osteophytes or antecephytes on x-rays, which is again a significant difference to the chronic um, um, degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament. Similar to the chronic degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament, um, there are intra and extra capsular techniques uh, available and uh, both of these techniques um, have been um, successful. Now to the major, uh, to the, the progressive degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament, which is um, you know the majority of diseases we uh, um, or problems we see related um, to the cranial cruciate ligament. Um, any kind of abnormal conformation, uh, abnormal gait, uh, then as well a steep, a very steep tibia plateau, and obesity and lack of fitness um, appear uh, to play a major role in the pathogenesis of, of um, this um, condition. And there's a wide variety of dogs, um, uh, dog breeds affected, um, such as uh, Mastiffs, uh, Rottweilers, Staffordshire Terriers and Labradors. Uh, these breeds um, um, seem to be predisposed. And it, there was an interesting study recently published um, as an epidemiologic, epidemiologic study that revealed that um, the contralateral cranial cruciate ligament can rupture in up to 50% uh, of the cases um, and um, this contralateral rupture can be seen from five mon months onwards um, up to um, 17 uh, months. There was, uh, uh, I think, a very, very interesting study um, looking into that problem. In case of a very, uh, of a uh, relatively stable partial tear the, of the cranial cruciate ligament, the lameness may be subtle and very often this lameness is only noted after um, periods of um, heavy exercise. As soon as we have, uh, are dealing with a, a complete rupture of the cranial cruciate ligament, the lameness can be severe to even non-weight bearing um, lameness. Um, but a very common um, clinical sign what owners uh, report is stiffness, uh, especially after rest, um, after heavy, uh, periods of heavy exercise. Physical examination usually reveals pain or crepitus and flexing or extending the stifle joint. Clicking might be present in case of a meniscal tear and quadriceps muscle atrophy uh, might be notable in cases um, that are very chronic. Um, very often uh, it's, it's not possible to feel that but in really very chronic cases um, that's the, that can be the case. What I find a much more sensitive test in order to uh, diagnose uh, a problem um, as early as possible is the so-called sit test um, and dogs will often sit with the affected leg positioned 
out to the side, uh, which you can see here, rather than sitting squarely. And this kind of uh, uh, situation uh, has been called as an abnormal sit test. So this is something what dogs um, show very early uh, in uh, the disease. Stifle joint effusion uh, can also be noted, and this is similar to the acute avulsion and acute uh, traumatic uh, rupture. Uh, but we also see something very early in the disease, which is called um, the so-called medial buttress. And if you look at this picture, uh, this is um, a so-called medial periarticular fibrosis, uh, which can be quite significant. And this change uh, might already be present uh, even before we, we feel um, uh, instability. So the medial buttress is a very uh, important test to diagnose, uh, especially a partial tear of the cranial cushion ligament. The cranial drawer test is a test everyone knows, and this test is able to detect um, an instable uh, stifle. Um, it's usually performed by positioning the knee in um, slight flexion, but it's recommended to retest um, the drawer at um, different angles of uh, extension and flexion. And any laxity is considered abnormal in an adult dog, however, up to a centimeter of uh, a drawer can be normal in a juvenile dog, so you have to be very careful uh, when assessing um, a young dog um, for a cruciate disease. And while uh, the uh, cranial drawer test is performed, uh, we should also recognize any signs uh, of pain. And if there is a positive drawer inflection, but a negative draw in extension, then uh, we might um, most likely uh, see a partial or have a partial tear of the craniomedial band of the cranial cruciate ligament. Um, so this is um, also quite an interesting um, test. Another uh, very commonly performed test is the tibial compression test, and this is a test uh, that all also uh, evaluates uh, the stability of the stifle joint. Um, this test can be performed uh, with the patient um, standing or with the patient being in a lateral recumbency. And in general, it's recommended that um, the index finger of one hand is positioned at the patella tendon, uh, and at the same time, uh, the tarsal joint is flexed uh, with the other hand, and any cranial tibial subluxation um, has to be considered abnormal if it's an adult or an immature dog um, that um, does not uh, make a difference. Now, why are radiographs uh, important um, to perform? Especially uh, radiographs uh, should help um, to, to identify a partial tear where we don't uh, feel any instability on our clinical examination. And one of the most uh, or one of the earliest and most consistent findings um, of uh, craniocruciate ligament disease is uh, loss of infrapatella fat um, pad shadow, uh, which um, tells us that uh, we uh, see um, joint diffusion. And when you look at uh, the picture on the left side um, with the triangle, uh, that's, that uh, tells us uh, we have uh, no joint diffusion. And uh, on the right side, you can see this black triangle being much smaller compared to the left side. And this tells us we have joint diffusion, so all this kind of soft um, tissue uh, density here is joint diffusion, and uh, this joint diffusion compresses uh, the um, radio a lucent uh, infrapatella fat pad. Radiographs are also performed in order to rule out other pathologies of the stifle, such as patella luxation, neoplasia, OCD, any kind of um, deformities of the femur and um, the tibia, or if we, uh, x-rays can also help us to identify avulsion uh, fractures and um, occasionally we might see uh, uh, meniscal mineralization as well. And I'm pretty sure that everybody has identified um, on the two radiographs that uh, we have um, uh, patella luxation, bilateral patella luxation uh, present. And um, this is, <laughs> this might be the only finding um, of the dog. However, we can uh, very often see uh, a combination of patella luxation and craniocruciate ligament disease. And it's also impossible then very often to say, uh, was it the chicken or the egg that was here first? Um, but it's important uh, 
to address uh, both uh, situations. So if we have patella luxation plus a cranial cruciate ligament um, that is uh, rupture, we have to uh, treat uh, both at the same time. Another very consistent uh, and early finding are ostifites or antecifites uh, in the region of the cranial cruciate ligament um, uh, attachment site, uh, which you can see here on, on that uh, picture, um, the red arrow uh, is highlighting that. Um, we can also see in, uh, ostifites at uh, the apex and the base of the patella, which you can see here, at the osteochondral margins of the femoral trochlear ridge. Um, this is uh, also a very common area for osteophytes to be seen, and uh, at the articular surfaces of um, the favelle. Other common findings are soft tissue swelling, uh, which uh, indicates medial buttress. Uh, so this type of medial buttress you should actually already be able to feel on your clinical examination. And we can also see narrowing of the intercondylar notch of the femur uh, due to osteophytes. And this is actually also a very, or can be a very early uh, finding um, uh, of uh, cranial crucial ligament disease. And if you are in, in doubt or if your clinical and radiological findings are inclusive, um, especially in the case of a partial tear, uh, synovial fluid analysis uh, can be recommended um, to rule out any other types of arthritis, um, for example, immune-mediated or even septic arthritis. Generally, MRI and ultrasound are of little additional diagnostic values, and it will usually be either arthroscopy, if you have um, the equipment, uh, or arthrotomy uh, that finally uh, confirm the presence of a partial tear or uh, any kind of meniscal um, pathology in case of a stable stifle joint. Good. So before discussing um, um, various medical and surgical treatment options, I was wondering if there are any questions uh, regarding anatomy of the cranial cruciate ligament disease or pathophysiology. Um, I've had one question come in. Um, would you consider cruciate surgery in a patient with well-advanced degenerative changes? Yeah, this is a, a very common question um, I uh, am asked um, by referring vets. Um, you know, does it make sense um, uh, to do surgery? Is there any kind of uh, possibility to improve? And the answer is there might be a significant improvement, uh, but uh, what is very important to tell the owner is that uh, it's unlikely uh, that uh, we can completely reverse the condition, but if we if we imagine uh, we have a meniscal um, tear, uh, prolapse of the caudal horn of the meniscus, as well as degenerative changes, it's usually the meniscus that is responsible for the clinical signs. And so, if you explore that stifle joint and sort out um, the meniscal damage, then uh, I'm pretty sure the dog will be significantly better. And very often, uh, these patients then um, can be managed very well with um, anti-inflammatory treatment and hydrotherapy, uh, which can be um, of um, you know can improve the quality of life um, significantly. Okay. Is that, uh, does that answer the question? Yes, that's great, Hannes. I think that's all. Any other questions? Um, or? That's the only one at the moment. Um, so if you want to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no more if there are no more questions, uh, then I will start um, discussing um, how we can manage patients suffering from uh, progressive degeneration of the cranial cruciate ligament. We talk about non-surgical treatment options and surgical treatment options. Briefly to our to the recommended non-surgical treatment options, they include uh, weight management, modification of uh, exercise, uh, plus minus rehabilitation, and medical uh, treatment. Usually dogs that weigh less than 10 kilos um, have adequate clinical function after conservative treatment. However, in dogs heavier than 10 kilos, the lameness might improve, at least initially, but they will never return to pre-injury activity. And this is also something what we uh, need to talk um, to the owner about. Um, it also depends on, on the activity level of um, the patient. And overall, we can say that surgical stabilization 
is recommended in patients of any size if we want to ensure optimal function. Whereas a broad range of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs has been approved for use in dogs, um, there's a much uh, narrower range available for cats. I always uh, start uh, treating, uh, so if, if NSAIDs are not uh, um, enough in, in treating uh, arthritic pain, I very often add um, opioids, the so-called rescue analgesics, such as tramadol or vetagesic. Um, I rarely um, have the experience that opioids alone um, are of any benefit, so it's usually the anti-inflammatory drugs um, that uh, can improve quality of life significantly. Gabapentin has been originally developed for um, treatment of epilepsy, um, but has uh, been commonly used now in patients with uh, neuropathic pain, and it's now more and more commonly used in, uh, to treat orthopedic pain. So this is definitely something what we can also try, so this multimodal um, uh, analgesic regime um, is also highly successful in treating arthritic pain. Adequan and cartophane uh, are very uh, well-known uh, drugs, uh, so they are so-called structure-modifying drugs, uh, which um, after having uh, performed um, multiple studies actually can be recommended with a so-called um, moderate level of comfort, um, so it's definitely uh, not wrong um, uh, to uh, have a four, six week um, cause of these drugs. Then uh, we also have uh, nutraceuticals uh, being an important part of medical treatment um, and overall it's the combination of chondroitin sulfate and glucose amino sulfate uh, which seem to be um, um, highly effective uh, in addition to um, essential fatty acids. Surgical therapy um, is usually divided into intracapsular and extracapsular reconstruction techniques and corrective osteotomies. However, uh, a very, very important part of um, stifle surgery is the meniscal inspection and resection if there um, is any, any problem. And this meniscal inspection um, and or treatment um, can be done either by open arthrotomy or again if arthroscopy equipment is available via arthroscopy. If we perform intracapsular um, and extracapsular techniques, a standard lateral parapatellar arthrotomy is uh, performed but in case of osteotomy procedures, it's usually a medial approach of the proximal tibia um, uh, that's used to um, access the stifle joint uh, because uh, for doing a TPLO and a TTA, we need a medial approach to the tibia, so this stifle approach can be combined with the tibial approach. Debridement, uh, yes or no. Um, overall, it depends what type of technique uh, you are then um, um, planning to do. The craniocruciate ligament uh, has to be inspected um, and uh, a small probe can also be used um, to then confirm rupture or laxity of the craniocruciate ligament. We usually recommend uh, to remove any kind of remnants of the damaged um, cranial cruciate ligaments. However, if we intend to do a TPLO and a TTA, it's usually um, recommended to debride the cranial cruciate ligament um, if uh, there's a complete tear, or in a case of an unstable partial tear, uh, but if um, there is a stable partial tear, it's usually enough to just uh, debride the damaged portions of um, the ligament and leave the intact uh, portions of the ligament um, um, uh, there. So the speed of clinical recovery um, usually depends on the presence of meniscal injury and the chronicity of the problem and not uh, uh, on the, um, uh, you know, debridement of the cranial cruciate ligament um, or not. However, the type of approach to the stifle joint is a very uh, significant or does have a very significant impact on a post-operative re post recovery as well. Um, and it's mainly the 
the retinacular, um, uh, patella retinaculum, what you can see here. If you manage to inspect the stifle joint without cutting through the retinaculum and without luxating the patella, which, you know, uh, luxation of the patella can only happen if, if you cut through the retinaculum, um, then dogs will put uh, weight on the operated leg much quicker. This means um, I, in an ideal case, uh, you just uh, make an arthrotomy in that area here, uh, so next uh, to the patella ligament, but before, um, so cranial to um, the ex uh, lateral ex extensor tendon, um, and with combining flexion and uh, extension, uh, it's actually physically possible to inspect all parts of the um, meniscus, especially the medial meniscus. So this is something uh, what can really make a significant difference in terms of speed of recovery. Meniscal inspection, as I already said, is a very important step of stifle surgery. Any kind of damage to the caudal body of the meniscus um, has to be um, addressed and it's actually a very common uh, um, issue. So in up to 77% of all meniscal injuries, it's the caudal horn um, um, of the medial meniscus that's affected. However, and this was a very surprising result, um, in, S, uh, in up to 77% of the cases we see radial tears of the lateral meniscus. So the lateral meniscus Hello, Hannes. We've just lost. Um, we've just lost you at the moment. I don't know whether you're picking us up. Okay, we'll just try and get in contact with Hannes. Um, Can you hear me? Oh yes, you're back now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We lost Hello? you then for a oh. few moments. Oh, where? Oh, I don't know. Okay, where, where did you lose me? Can you? I, I, <laughs> um, I think you just talked about the lateral where meniscus and 77% of tears. Okay, lateral meniscus. Yep. Okay, sorry about right. that. I don't know what happened. No, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay, fine. Okay, good. Sorry about right. that. <laughs> good. Um, so, I... Uh, I think I was lost when I was talking, uh, I started to talk about um, the lateral uh, meniscus and that we actually can see in a significant uh, proportion of um, cases, a so-called radial tears in up to 77% of the cases um, um, of meniscal tears, it was a radial tear of the lateral meniscus that has been seen. Usually uh, we know that uh, caudal horn protrusions uh, cause significant um, lameness but we don't know yet um, if these radial tears of the lateral meniscus um, um, have a similar clinical significance. It might be just a coincidental finding. But what we used to say is um, that we will hear a so-called meniscal click in a case of a meniscal injury, but this meniscal click is actually only present in uh, up to 27% of the cases with meniscal injury. That means uh, three quarters of our patients that actually have a meniscal injury um, are not having the meniscal click and this might be a false negative clinical finding. In general, a craniomedial arthrotomy is more sensitive than a craniolateral approach in diagnosing meniscal tears, especially um, uh, if we look at the medial meniscus, but it's still the case uh, that arthroscopy is having um, the highest sensitivity. So if you uh, have access to arthroscopy, uh, it will be again uh, a very, very uh, good thing um, to, to do and um, to detect um, especially uh, minor meniscal injuries uh, as soon as possible. You can again use uh, the probe um, to increase, uh, to have an increased sensitivity and specificity, um, um, but stifled retractors um, are usually or very commonly used um, to help improving the exposure to the caudal pole of the meniscus. However, um, as I used um, to or still um, 
very often arthroscopically inspect um, the stifle for any kind of uh, meniscal tears, I learned um, to perform even open myphotomies uh, without stifle retractors. And it's again um, the combination of flexion and uh, extension and having actually an assistant um, that subluxates the tibia, cran tibia cranially. Um, that enables me to have a look at the caudal horn of the meniscus uh, without using stifle retractors. I mean, it's better to use a stifle extractor, uh, a distractor to have a look at the caudal horn, um, but um, the stifle retractor, if it's not uh, um, no, uh, well used, uh, can cause significant um, degree of damage. Meniscectomy overall, so removal of, of the whole meniscus, can have surprisingly excellent short-term outcome um, and it can resolve clinical symptoms rapidly, but it's then uh, it, the patient will definitely have a problem uh, in terms of long-term prognosis, uh, which we have to consider to be less uh, favorable because uh, removal of the meniscus will lead to significant progression of osteoarthritis. Therefore, we should try to uh, perform a partial meniscectomy whenever possible. And uh, by then combining the meniscal, partial meniscal resection with one of the osteotomy procedures, we then uh, should be able to protect the intact part of the meniscus from any postliminary tear. Meniscal release uh, used to be recommended um, or is, uh, generally recommended in cases of a TTA and TP law and this has been, um, uh, not, is not the case anymore uh, and nowadays we say the meniscal release uh, can only be justified when the incidence of menis uh, meniscal, release, uh, men meniscal tears is unacceptably um, high. But even a meniscal release is not always effective in preventing postliminary tears. So if you are in doubt, um, the so-called caudal pole hemimeniscectomy, where we uh, remove the caudal uh, part of the meniscus, um, this part of the meniscus um, uh, is usually preferred. So I usually start um, putting a probe into the medial caudal part of the meniscus, pull it um, cranially and then take my 11 scalpel blade or beaver blade and make the first cut and then um, I remove um, the rest of the diseased bit. In human uh, orthopedic surgery usually a primary repair of the meniscus um, can be tried and is usually very successful but it's a different story in dogs because in dogs the cranial crucial ligament disease is a more chronic injury and uh, overall the meniscus in a dog is not um, as vascular as uh, in uh, human beings, hence the healing is, is very poor. So it's not recommended to try to suture um, any kind of meniscal injury. Now let's start talking about the different um, uh, reconstructive techniques uh, with uh, intra-articular uh, techniques, uh, you know, being the first um, uh, techniques um, invented for treatment of cruciate disease. They used to be very popular. However, nowadays they have mostly been replaced uh, by the lateral fabellus suture, um, the TPLO and um, the TPLO. Uh, TPLO and TTA and if we look at uh, the, so a graft is usually used and is placed intra-articularly to imitate um, the cranial cruciate ligament um, so we need to discuss um, the position uh, at the femur and the position at the tibia and um, it's still uh, recommended um, to use the over-the-top position on the femur and uh, on the tibia it makes sense to um, fix the the uh, insertion as close to the original uh, insertion of the cranial cruciate ligament. And in terms of grafts, it's still the patella ligament and fascia lata that are most commonly used uh, as autografts. The clinical results can overall be considered as good, uh, which uh, is overall comparable to extra articular uh, techniques. However, as the cranial tibial thrust is not neutralized with uh, intraticular um, techniques, um, these uh, grafts are subjected to significant loads um, and therefore we see graft failure or stretching very commonly. 
the fibula head uh, transposition um, uh, in, in that type of technique, uh, we try to advance, so mobilize and advance the fibula head uh, cranially. Um, this is then altering the orientation of the lateral collateral ligament, which prevents, um, as a consequence, uh, cranial draw movement, and it also limits internal rotation of the tibia. However, the stifle joint very often remains unstable as um, the collateral ligament is very often stretched and we also see implant failure very commonly as a common complication. Therefore, the female head uh, transposition technique uh, appears to have fallen out of favor with uh, most uh, surgeons and it's the extracapsular techniques uh, that have largely replaced intracapsular techniques and they are supposed to be quicker compared to intraarticular techniques and simpler to perform and better outcomes have been reported, but it's still um, a good outcome what we have to give uh, uh, dogs undergoing extracapsular stabilization, which is not uh, significantly different to uh, intracapsular um, uh, stabilization techniques. Overall, uh, uh, so another big advantage uh, of extracapsular techniques compared to intracapsular techniques is that uh, we see fewer and much less detrimental uh, complications. The downside or a big disadvantage of extracapsular techniques uh, is that they rely on periarticular fibrosis for long-term stability that, uh, because any kind of implants that are used um, for extracapsular stabilization will eventually fail. Uh, and the problem is if this periarticular fibrosis has not um, occurred before the implants fail, then uh, we still um, have to deal with an uh, instable um, stifle. Nylon leader line has been shown overall to be superior to any other types of nylon, but that's uh, at the moment um, uh, you know, one of the most commonly used sewage materials and is a very good sewage material, so there's no reason uh, to change that. Um, but what has changed significantly is uh, the way uh, these uh, sutures um, are tensioned, um, but we see uh, uh, the um, fixation of nylon leader line with a metallic crimp um, tube to be superior uh, to any other techniques. Um, so uh, the knot technique um, um, has probably already or will be uh, uh, replaced by the crimping technique. And there is at the moment uh, kind of research going on uh, how strong the leader line uh, needs to be, but overall we say that the strength of the line um, should in general be at least equivalent uh, to the body weight of the patient. So the nylon is still uh, does not have to be changed. Um, the fixation of the suture material has changed a little bit, but uh, what um, uh, now uh, what we uh, try to do is uh, as well to changing our anchorage uh, sites of the um, extracapsular um, graft. So we try to get um, so-called isometric um, anchorage uh, points at the femur and at uh, the tibia. However, there is no combination of femur and tibial points that is truly isometric. So we are usually talking about um, so-called quasi-isometric points, so certain pairs of points are closer to isometric than others, and um, studies have looked into these kind of uh, quasi-isometric um, anchorage points and if you look at the femur, F2, so the distal uh, fabella um, site, um, appears to be uh, the most isometric, um, uh, or closest isometric um, proximal anchorage fixation and it's T3, um, um, which is very close to the extensor groove, uh, which would be the most isometric um, uh, or quasi-isometric anchorage fixation at the uh, tibia. So what um, we used to do is um, placing the distal uh, uh, part of the suture somewhere uh, here or fixing here either with one or two bone tunnels uh, and there is uh, now a shift to more proximal, more caudal, which is a little bit more tricky um, um, to do, but if you use F and T3, uh, then you would have the least amount of stress uh, on your suture material. Uh, 
And if the female tabella suture is anchored at non-isometric suture sites, um, uh, then we have increased stress on the graft, uh, which might lead uh, to suture breakage, um, elongation, and any kind of knot or crimp um, slippage. So in using uh, quasi-isometric uh, suture sites, we see much uh, fewer of um, uh, these complications. And there was one modification of um, the lateral fabellotibial suture uh, introduced the so-called um, tightrope um, technique uh, which uses a fiber wire and this technique is uh, or tries to be minimal invasive and bone-to-bone uh, -bone anchorage uh, via femoral and tibial tunnels um, is used. And the tightrope uh, procedure is uh, the, the first uh, extracapsular technique that combines these quasi-isometric suture anchorage sites with a high tensile strength uh, suture material. And what um, recently published studies say that uh, with this type of technique, uh, um, patients have a nearly normal range of motion and this range of motion um, can also be uh, maintained and um, the results overall seem to be quite promising. Um, so um, that's uh, all what I wanted uh, to say to these intra and extra capsular techniques. Are there any questions um, so far to the techniques I've mentioned? Yes, we have one question that's come in um, involving inspecting okay. Yeah, okay. inspecting the stifle joint and the caudal horn of the medial meniscus. Is it possible to do this adequately mm -hmm. through a small incision without arthroscopy? And if it is, um, would you be able to show us how to do that, please? Okay, can I go back to... Can yes. I just uh, go back to... Um, um, presentation. Um, let me just go back to one slide. So this is uh, just briefly. This is the the kind of. Um, uh, so there was a question uh, about um, inspecting the stifle joint via minimal invasive uh, approach. So this is the usual kind of microinvasive uh, approach uh, we used um, to do. But what I um, have tried to do is um, um, to do an approach without arthroscopy. So this is an I call this an open arthrotomy, where you just make an incision. Um, into the skin, which uh, might initially be two centimeters long, but you can, uh, you know, it can be just one centimeter long, and you go from here, um, use a Gelpi, re uh, Gelpi um, uh, distractor um, plus a sand retractor, and the sand retractor can be hooked um, into the tibial tuberosity here, and the Gelpi retractor is spreading the patellar ligament um, uh, against the extensor uh, tendon, and uh, you might uh, use a rangea to remove a little bit of the fat body here, uh, but then if you, if you try to flex and extend the stifle joint and uh, use your surgical light um, and having an assistant who is actually uh, pulling on the, on the sand retractor, you will be surprised how well you can inspect the caudal horn of the meniscus. And it's usually, uh, so the caudal horn of the meniscus usually protrudes or prolapses um, if you have a, a complete instable situation. In, th in these instable situations, it's anyway quite easy to do a subluxation of the stifle joint. So if you have a partial tear, um, that's then getting quite um, difficult um, to really and then um, uh, work uh, with a caudal horn without damaging cartilage, but the inspection uh, can also be done uh, via uh, that approach. I mean, it sounds quite um, different, and you might not believe me, but if you if you have the chance um, um, to to uh, practice, uh, it, it's amazing how uh, well these dogs do if you don't cut through the retinaculum patella. Uh, and overall. Uh, <laughs> we try to be as good as we can with our extra capsular techniques and if it's the approach that can improve the results of extra capsular techniques significantly um, you know then it's at least um, worth um, trying it is that answering um, yeah the that's fine question? we have another question that's come in how tight do you recommend okay. the, nylon, the nylon suture before crimping um, the, the delegate has previously been told as tight as your question. shoelaces, <laughs> but is this is is this adequate? Oh well, it depends. 
Yeah, it's a very good question, and actually, at the moment, um, we we uh, because we use more isometric uh, or we test um, um, the tightening of the suture with more isometric anchorage points. Uh, we we do less and less tightening. Uh, so the idea is to disturb the joint function as little as we can with our extracapsular technique. So usually what I try to do, if I have a complete um, tear, I have my assistant or I, I start uh, putting the, the stifle in a normal position and then I start pulling on the suture material and uh, while my assistant continues pulling um, the uh, suture, uh, I uh, apply the crimp. So it's always the kind of finding the balance, not being too tight but tight enough. Um, and if you use this uh, quasi-isometric suture, anchorages, then less tension is needed and then we have less stress on, a, on, on the suture line and we have less implant failure. So I tend to do less and uh, tend to tension uh, um, less and less, but what I usually do is uh, I pre-tension and then I have my assistant um, to um, keep the tension and I test for a cranial drawer. And um, the, the kind of um, tension that's needed um, to eliminate the uh, tibia, um, the cranial drawer movement, then uh, uh, that's the tension I, I, I would um, think um, is, is, is acceptable. Any other question? Alison, um, I can't hear you. Is there any other question? Sorry, sorry Hannah. Where and how would you anchor okay. the okay. suture? Okay, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Where and how would you anchor the suture in the tibia yeah. using a lateral fibella procedure, please? Um, yeah. Then I just go to the picture I have shown um, here. So overall, <clears throat> what? Um, I uh, started to do is, uh, if you talk about the female uh, anchorage point, um, I have started to use so-called suture screws, uh, which you can get, um, they are you know, not more expensive than normal uh, screws you can get from veterinary instrumentation. Uh, and I used um, to, anyway, use two bone tunnels, um, um, one roughly here and one uh, roughly here around T1. And w with the two bone tunnels, um, I was using and the suture, uh, placing the suture through one bone tunnel, going to the medial side and then coming back um, um, and then tightening the suture on the lateral side. So what I now do, I just drill the two bone tunnels uh, more caudal um, uh, than I used to do. So I try to go closer to uh, T3 um, um, as um, uh, I try to be, or we should try to be as quasi asymmetric as we can. Okay, that's all the questions Any for the other moment. Questions? That that's all the questions for the moment, Hannes. Thank you. Okay. Good. Then I just need to go for the okay. So as um I have um um already mentioned that overall we get quite good results with our intracapsular and extracapsular techniques um, Why doing something different. Um, and I just want to mention um, all the kind of osteotomy procedures that are available, but will not go into too much detail uh, because, as I said, it will be mainly the extracapsular uh, technique that uh, we uh, uh, need to focus on. So uh, why doing something different? Um, one, the, one of the reasons is that almost all intracapsular and extracapsular prosthesis will stretch um, or fail and this might often uh, happen within a few weeks. So the long-term stabilization uh, of extracapsular techniques rely on periarticular fibrosis which we, or that's why we we uh, very often need to do a revision surgery if this uh, if the prosthesis fails before this uh, fibrosis has occurred. We also see a very high incidence of meniscal injury after prosthesis stabilization, and which is a significant difference to osteotomy procedures. And it's also the clinical recovery, which um, can be considered low. So we take uh, we talk about three to ten days before patients start to wait there after extracapsular techniques and up to six months uh, might need to pass before we reach the optimal outcome uh, we can uh, achieve in, in that certain patient. 
And also, intra and extra capsular techniques are not eliminating the cranial tibial thrust. And this cranial tibial thrust can be successfully eliminated by using um, osteotomy techniques. And these osteotomy techniques aim at restoring uh, the stifle anatomy um, um, that initially has predisposed um, the cranial cruciate ligament um, to fail. So we talk about the cranial closing wedge osteotomy, the tibial plateau level osteotomy, the tibial torosity osteotomy, and the triple tibial osteotomy. The cranial closing wedge osteotomy overall does not require a special um, equipment, which is a huge advantage compared to, for example, TPLO. Um, we can also treat tibial deformities um, and uh, one big advantage of cranial closing wedge osteotomy is that um, we can perform this technique in immature techniques, uh, immature um, dogs, I'm sorry, because the osteotomy is in an area where um, growth plates will not be um, um, affected. However, uh, a large um, um, closing wedge osteotomy might cause limb shortening. Uh, we might also move the patella too far distal. Uh, we might uh, create um, hyperextension of the joint and the tibial plateau angle is, is very variable. So the biomechanical rationale behind the T-pillow is um, elimination of the cranial tibial uh, thrust. Um, so that's uh, what we try to do. Um, it's a very complex uh, pathophysiology. Uh, I, I don't want to go into too uh, much detail, uh, but what we need uh, is uh, much more extensive preoperative planning. So it's important to uh, do um, mediolateral and uh, cranial caudal um, uh, views in order to um, assess the tibial plateau angle and uh, any kind of uh, um, uh, deformities. And uh, the tibial plateau axis is then uh, established um, 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 uh, in, uh, with, uh, in order to be able to measure the tibial plateau um, angle, uh, which uh, you can see here, so that you usually draw the tibia long axis, which you can see here, and the tibia uh, plateau, and then um, uh, this is the angle, uh, the so-called tibia plateau angle at the intersection of the tibia plateau and the tibia long axis point. And, uh, if um, this angle is higher than 30 degrees, uh, this means it's, it's definitely excessive, and we try to reduce that angle to th six and a half um, uh, degrees. So this is how um, a tibia plateau, um, uh, so TPLO, a procedure is, is carried out, so we need to use a biradial saw, uh, we need to use a jig, uh, and then after rotation of the tube part, so we uh, have to stabilize with a plate. Um, advantages of a TBLO uh, compared to, uh, to conventional techniques is that most dogs uh, bear weight um, sooner and also the lameness resolves sooner. So we talk about um, very often after a day, uh, dogs start to bear weight on uh, the leg and the lameness uh, resolves within two to four weeks um, compared to uh, you know, two to six months, what we have heard. And we have already seen, or we try to now look into long-term outcome um, uh, of patients undergoing a TPLA and TPLO, and some patients actually have not um, uh, uh, had any progression of osteoarthritis, and in some patients, uh, the periarticular thickening um, has um, um, uh, reduced, but we know that TPLO um, can have loads uh, of complications. It's a difficult um, surgery with a very distinct learning curve. Um, however, most of the um, complications um, can be avoided, um, um, so uh, it depends on, on um, the clinical uh, expertise uh, mainly. So put fissures in something uh, what or should not occur, uh, but if they occur then uh, they need to be uh, stabilized in order to uh, prevent the catastrophe. Um, fracture. Usually fibular fractures are not um, uh, of major concern, but it's uh, uh, septic arthritis um, that uh, should um, scare us. Uh, and overall we see a significant in significantly increased risk of MRSP-related uh, infection uh, since recently. And it's then overall the length of surgery that appears to be a, a significant contributing uh, factor. So again, it's surgical expertise, surgical experience um, um, that is very important to avoid um, uh, complications. Um, 
but another advantage is the use or the combination of a TPLO with um, the uh, before mentioned cranial closing wedge osteotomy in dogs with an excessive tibial plateau um, such as Rottweilers, um, um, they can have very often a, a very excessive tibial plateau. So we, we combine a TPLO in a cranial closing wedge osteotomy to reduce the tibial plateau angle to six and a half degrees in, in dogs, for example, that have uh, 40 or 50 degrees uh, of tibial plateau. And the TPLO can also be used um, to, to uh, treat tibia vara um, malformations, but this is uh, nothing uh, for, for uh, a beginner, but um, uh, just to, to show you how versatile TPLO can be. Um, the TTA is um, the, another uh, very, very commonly performed um, osteotomy procedure. Uh, the TTA stabilizes the stifle joint during weight, weight bearing, um, again by neutralizing the cranial tibial uh, thrust, but instead of a, a curved cut, a frontal plane osteotomy of the tibial crest um, is performed and then the tibial torosity is um, advanced uh, uh, by using a cage. Uh, the uh, um, kind of the purpose of the TTA um, is again to uh, neutralize the cranial um, tibial thrust, but what we try to do is to decrease this um, uh, patella tendon angle, so the angle between the tibial plateau and uh, the patella ligament um, to 90 degrees. So before a TTA, we hopefully you agree it's definitely more than 90 degree here and after doing the TTA, um, it's reduced um, to 90 degree. The pre-operative planning uh, is uh, less complex, you usually have um, standardized transparencies that can be used to decide how big the plate is and how big the, the cage needs to be. Um, surgery um, um, is, is um, usually uh, straightforward, uses titanium implants and a, a, a huge sortiment of cages is available, but we see again uh, loads of different complications, um, so cage uh, malpositionings, um, uh, which you can see here, breakage of the tibial torosity needed to be fixed with tension band wire fixation, um, then in this case um, the the cut was made too far caudal um, and this catastrophic failure had to be fixed with um, a, a, a plate. And, um, Similar to a TPLO, uh, TTA can also be uh, used um, to treat other uh, diseases, uh, concomitant diseases, um, such as uh, patella luxation, and that's a huge and uh, one of the most important advantages of a TTA. So we can combine a tibial torosity advancement with a tibial crest transposition or tibial torosity transposition, so the TTT. Um, um, so that's very, very uh, um, convenient if you have a medial or a lateral patella luxation uh, to then move um, the tibial torosity to either the medial or the lateral side um, as well. And now, uh, just briefly, uh, should it be a TPLO or a TTA? If you compare these two techniques, uh, we have a number of uh, advantages and, and disadvantages. Uh, the TPLO, for example, is overall a more versatile procedure than the TTA if you have an excessive tibial plateau slope um, and if you have um, angular or rotational deformities. On the other side, um, uh, TTA uh, can, um, has, has biomechanical uh, advantages, um, seems to be less invasive, uh, simpler, and uh, already mentioned we can treat patella luxation as well. And there were a few companies that tried to um, do something different. Securus has tried um, to use um, screws instead of uh, a fork here, but Overall, I, I doubt um, that um, this is actually a better uh, system than um, Cayenne. I personally uh, find uh, placing a fork uh, into the tibial torosity, tibial crest, much uh, uh, simpler. TTO uh, was also um, um, uh, introduced a few years ago, uh, but um, overall um, it's getting a little bit out of, of fashion and uh, still there are no biomechanical investigations uh, available that um, compare the efficacy of the TTO, but what the TTO does, um, it combines um, uh, a little bit of a, it's something in between, uh, sorry, something in between a TPLO and a TTA, so we have a similar cut as a TTA, and then we have a wedge um, ostectomy, and after doing these two osteotomies, we kind of advance the tibial torosity a little bit and 
um, um, compress uh, these um, two um, uh, parts here, so we um, have a reduction of tibia plateau angle as well. Uh, but uh, I think um, uh, we have um, significant disadvantages and only minimal advantages of a TTO, and one of the proposed advantages was um, it, uh, it should be an easy technique, but when you look at the preoperative uh, planning uh, template, um, I don't find this uh, technique uh, very easy. And also in terms of complications, I have seen um, as many and as catastrophic uh, complications in a TTO compared to um, um, TPLOs and TTA. So I think overall, um, at the moment, um, uh, the searches are looking into uh, the modified uh, Mackey procedure, which overall uses the same principle as the tibial porosity advancement, um, the TTA. However, the MMP leaves uh, uh, the distal bony attachment intact to the tibial shaft and uh, the tuberosity is or is not reinforced by a, a wire. And then a cage or a wedge is then used to stabilize the tibial tuberosity. However, um, there is, uh, you know, we would need long-term follow-up and force plate analysis to compare the MMT to the, both the TTA and the TPLO. Um, overall, uh, it uh, appears to be definitive a simpler uh, procedure, um, um, but <laughs> it again depends uh, what uh, you know. If you are on the top of your learning curve, if you have, if you do TPLOs on a regular basis or TTAs on a regular basis, I think it's not really an easier surgery um, and a faster surgery is another question. Um, if you uh, on the top of your learning curve doing TTAs, a TTA should last between 30 and 45 uh, minutes. Um, Maybe you can do uh, the MMP uh, in a little bit um, as a shorter uh, time, but again with complications, um, um, there's overall you know similar complications to a TTA um, can occur. Um, what might be a little bit interesting to find out um, combining titanium with steel if this has a, an impact. But we are still uh, early days, um, so we're waiting for biomechanical um, studies um, to to tell us how efficient um, um, the MMP uh, procedure is. So now, question, um, which osteotomy um, should um, you choose? And it's um, um, similar to loads of other um, surgical techniques. A surgeon's preference is um, a, a significant uh, factor. Uh, we overall can achieve similar outcome between uh, TTA and uh, TPLO. Um, but it uh, appears to be uh, the biomechanics uh, that should um, let us decide, uh, for example, to choose a TTA if you have the tibia, a tibia plateau angle um, being less than 25 degrees. Um, if you have a tibia plateau angle um, between 25 and 35 degrees, uh, then we should go for a TPLO. And if the TPL, a tibia plateau angle is um, higher than 35 degrees, then a TPLO uh, combined with a cranial closing wedge also to me is indicated. And now um, I'm approaching uh, the end um, of my uh, presentation. Uh, so take home message uh, for um, uh, today. Uh, after you, you might be completely confused uh, what to do with a patient suffering from cranial cruciate ligament now uh, after hearing all these different um, tech, uh, treatment options. But what I think is most important in dealing with these patients um, is establishing a diagnosis as early as possible. As the earlier we diagnose uh, cranial cruciate ligament disease, the less likely the risk of um, meniscal damage, um, the more likely we can preserve a part of the cranial cruciate ligament and the better um, the outcome. So testing for medial buttress is um, a very early um, uh, possibility to diagnose um, that uh, disease. Important to know that medical treatment um, is, uh, has its limitations for cranial cruciate ligament disease. What is definitive or what can make a huge uh, difference, um, especially if you want to compare extracapsular techniques with um, osteotomy procedures, is the approach. So if you try to be as minimal invasive as you can, uh, you can increase uh, or uh, increase the post-operative uh, um, um, outcome significantly. Important, take your time when inspecting um, the meniscus. Any kind of meniscal injury needs um, uh, to be uh, addressed. And uh, probably extra capsular techniques uh, might appear most uh, useful um, in the general 
practice uh, settings, um, but what we should focus on more in, in the future is try using isometric um, anchorages. As, as, the, uh, as osteotomy procedures try to restore anatomy, um, they appear to be the best options available to treat craniocruciate ligament disease. However, um, we, we have cost um, and possible catastrophic uh, complications that might be prohibitive in a large number um, of cases. So, um, thank you so far for, for your attention and uh, I just wanted to ask if there are um, any questions um, I can um, answer. Yes, we have a question. Um, in a dog with a partial tear okay. and arthrotomy, but with no instability yeah. in the stifle, would you still place a nylon suture? The answer is no. These, uh, this would be a situation where um, the osteotomy, uh, so one of the osteotomies uh, would appear to be most um, successful because uh, what we try then to do is to restore the anatomy, we try to reduce the stress on a cranial cruciate ligament, um, so if we successfully perform um, one of these osteotomy procedures, we should not have any cranial tibial thrust, so overall we would not need the cranial cruciate ligament, so the deterioration and the damage, the constant damage of the cranial cruciate ligament um, can be stopped. And um, probably more important is that we uh, avoid um, stress um, uh, on, on the meniscus, so the idea is then to preserve um, um, the meniscus. So for what I um, currently treat most often uh, with osteotomy procedures is uh, the partial tear, which I diagnose with, you know, I, I can't find a cranial drawer, but I see degenerative changes in x-rays, there might be joint diffusion, and very often you have uh, already a medial buttress, or when you do the cranial drawer movement, you feel pain. Um, so an extra capsular suture is not uh, indicated, uh, it's only uh, indicated if there is um, a complete um, um, tear or an instable partial tear. Okay. Is there a other we question? We do. Um, we're going back to extracapsular stabilization. Does the tunnel extend mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. to the medial side of the tibia at T3? Yes, that's, I mean, it, it depends how you, you fix um, uh, or what type of anchorage you, you use. I mean, if we talk, uh, if we uh, think about um, the tight rope, procedure, then we use bone tunnels uh, um, um, that uh, penetrate through the, the uh, tibia, completely through the far cortex. And the two uh, tunnel technique I have described, I penetrate completely uh, through um, the lateral and medial cortex and then so go with the suture through one tunnel and coming back with the suture on the more distal tunnel. Yes, it's perforating um, the, the tunnel completely. And how do you fix the suture to the tibia? Um, I would, I would just um, the end that comes out again on the medial side will then be just um, um, tight with um, the the suture coming from the the femur. And at the femur, I use um, um, suture screws, as I said before. So I don't need um, any any extra anchorage um, for the kind of simple extra capsular technique um, I um, uh, have tried to, to do um, 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 again. And finally, um, in cases where you have a patient with concurrent cranial cruciate ligament disease and patella luxation, can you combine an extra capsular mm -hmm. suture technique with tibial crest transposition? Um, yes, potentially you can, but it, it, it gets um, um, a little bit more difficult. What I very often anyway do if I have a, a patient uh, suffering from patella luxation is first of all doing uh, whatever is necessary in terms of sulco, trochiloplasty, um, try uh, to do capsular 
um, release uh, facial imbrication techniques and then make my tibial crest transposition and uh, very often it's then internal rotation that still predisposes the, knee, the patella to luxate so I place so-called anti-rotational suture um, uh, occasionally which you know I then use really the fabella um, go around the fabella and somewhere um, distal and caudal to the tibial um, um, a TTT cut, so making sure that my um, that I'm not drilling uh, through uh, the osteotomy, so that I don't um, damage my uh, tibial porosity uh, transposition. Uh, but yes, you 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 can uh, combine these two um, techniques.